Uh, good evening, everyone. Uh, my name is Rira, and on behalf of Roman's Bookstore, I'd like to welcome you all to our virtual event with Bethany C. Morrow and Emily Henry. Uh, we're so grateful that all of you could make it tonight and that our bookstore is able to continue doing these types of events where we can bring authors and their works to our community. Um, we are doing more virtual events, so our next virtual event is scheduled for Wednesday, June 17th at 6 p.m. with Jocelyn Ramirez. And you can learn more about future virtual events on our website's calendar as well as our social media. Um, this evening's event includes a Q&A, so to submit a question, please use the Ask a Question button at the very bottom of the screen. Uh, if you see a question on the list that you'd like for our guests to answer, you can vote for it, and the question will make its way to the top of the list. And of course, we'll try to answer as many questions as time will allow. And uh, for this event, attendees who purchase a copy of A Song Below Water from Romans will receive a signed book plate and also an exclusive enamel pin while Yay! supplies last. Oh so uh, if you click on the green purchase button directly below the viewer screen, that'll take you to our website where you can complete your purchase. And if you want your signed book plate and pin, just make sure to write book plate in the notes when you're checking out. That way we know that you were one of the events, uh, event attendees. And with that out of the way, let me introduce our authors for tonight. Uh, Bethany is the editor of the young adult anthology, Take the Mic, as well as the author of the speculative novel, Mem. Uh, splitting her time between Montreal, Quebec and upstate New York, Bethany has a bachelor's in sociology from UC Santa Cruz and studied clinical psych clinical psychological research at the University of Wales. Though sociology and forensic psychology will always be among her passions, writing has always been a lifelong endeavor. A Song Below Water is her first standalone young adult novel. And joining her tonight is Emily Henry, the author of the recently released The Love That Split the World and A Million Junes. And with that said, I'm going to turn the camera over to our guests. Enjoy the talk, everyone. So the first thing I have to say, of course, is um, go banana slugs, as we're saying <laughs> in the chat here. <laughs> is that the UC Santa Cruz uh, mascot? Yep. Banana slugs? That's banana so obvious. Banana slugs. And if you, if you come across one, firstly, I'm sorry, they're hideous. Uh, <laughs> I would assume. You have but you have to take a picture kissing it. <laughs> so, and then, yeah, it's. Wow. So that I took is the picture dedication. for my girlfriend. She yeah. kissed it. I took the picture. You're like, that's not... basically like she, I did She's it. telling the truth. Yes, I am. You have to take a picture <laughs> kissing it. <laughs> wow. That is so cruel. It's like, you're really only coming to this college if you are like in it. Like, oh, you yeah, don't get to just is... casually go to UC Santa Cruz. This is a very, like, very environmental. I mean, it's, it, it's yeah. in a Redwood yeah. forest oh. like you're in a nature preserve so it's you have to really be about that life <laughs> that's amazing i have been yeah. to santa cruz once and it was incredible i was probably there for one hour and i loved it <laughs> <laughs> well you know what you can pretty much do almost everything there is to do in yeah. santa cruz in about two hours so so i really you, need to go back is what i'm hearing for, for one hour just yeah. for one additional for one. one hour <laughs> yeah <laughs> well should i should i like start with my little intro for you how do yes, you feel? But I, but I okay. do want to say that Emily's most recently released book is actually Beach Read, which is an adult market romance rom com that I cannot yes. wait to read. So oh. I just want to, so that people know that if you want to purchase very nice. any of our books, she also has. But Beach also, read. that can wait <laughs> because Perfect. this book. Okay, so. I, Bethany and I talked yesterday and I was kind of like, I wrote 4 million questions for you that we will not get to, but I just wanted to like, you know, see what she's sick of talking about and whatever. And so she asked actually if I could describe the plot of A Song Below Water a bit to you all so that she doesn't have to. Again, and I also, I'm so sorry. <laughs> no, I'm excited too, although I did not practice. So this is going to be, you're going to see how good I am I'm, at being I'm, like. I'm excited. I'm excited. <laughs> it's going to be a lot of, and also. I can't even describe my own book. So it's going to be hard for this one. But I do want to say something, which is I read this book months ago. I'm still waiting for my finished copy. That's why I've got the, the ARC here. Um, but I read this book months ago. And today I was like, you know what? I should like skim it again, make sure it's fresh in my memory. And I literally reread the whole second half, like the whole thing. And oh just was gosh. like, oh, oh. And like, didn't mean to at all. And it was like, 
the best part of my week. So it is fairly fresh in my memory. <laughs> and I, there was a part of my day today where I was sort of like kind of dipping and feeling kind of blah and bad about the state yeah. of the world and whatever. And I was just like, you know what? Maybe tomorrow I'll just like read the first half again. So <laughs> A Song Below Water is an amazing contemporary YA fantasy um, that is about Effie and Tavia who are sister friends. They've been living together for like, I think three years, right? Mm -hmm. um, and they're just the epitome of sisterhood and friendship. Their relationship is really, I mean, I love everything that you do, but I think their relationship is what makes this book so propulsive to me. I'm very much a character reader and you yeah. always nail that, but these girls specifically like had my heart from page one. Um, and I like want to get close to, closer. They're so, so is, beautiful. They're gorgeous. They're, they're gorgeous. gorgeous. Honestly, when I saw this cover, I probably just like screamed. Um, I did. We have Tavia and Effie. Um, and basically this world um, is very much like our own. The book takes place in Portland, um, but there are people with like additional attributes or I forget what you like extra, traits there's some some phrasing that Tavia uses at some I, point. yeah but basically they're I, supernatural beings yeah um and Tavia is a siren which she has had to keep as a secret for her whole life because sirens are very persecuted in this world um they're seen as very dangerous um and her family especially her father is just very scared of her being outed and of what the world will do to her if they know that she has this siren ability, these these calls she can do, this way of using her voice that's very powerful. Um, because yeah, they're just seen as very innately dangerous. Um, and Effie, meanwhile, is like, yeah, just the perfect sister friend. She's like got her sister's back. She's like knows this secret and does everything she can to guard it. And the girls are really there for each other. Effie also has like a complicated past. Um, her mother has passed away. She is having some weird things going on in her own life and doesn't really know what's up, but she's like trying to be there for Tavia and kind of put her own stuff on the back burner as friends and sisters do um, to varying results. And at the start of the book, you know, all this is going on and they're in high school. So like, yeah. gross and they're in high school <laughs> so the worst thing of all we're in high school right. um and in the beginning of a book a black woman is murdered and in the resulting like media firestorm um there are people saying that she was a siren and basically that this like justifies her murder. And so her character, her integrity is all like being interrogated in the way that we see so often when black people, men, women, like everyone, children, um, when they're killed. We see this in the media. We see people being like, well, but you know, right. they, they, they no did angel. bad things. They were right. no angel. Exactly. Um, and so Tavia is watching this happen and it's very frightening to her on multiple levels. In this world also, I should have said that all sirens are black and we will come back to that um, because it's a very integral part of the story. But yeah, Tavia is watching this happen and feeling this fear for herself and also this like anger and frustration that she's watching this woman's death be turned into like like a trial of her, yeah. of the woman who was killed. Um, and yeah, I mean, there's just a lot. She's in a pressure cooker, cooker situation and essentially like she, her voice kind of starts to take over and it forces her life forward and it forces her sort of out in a way um, that feels quite dangerous, but also like, you know, she's kind of forced to reckon with like the truth of who she is and her own power and it's incredible. If you can't tell from my very <laughs> bad description of it, it's incredible on every level. And it's also like weirdly fun for a book that's like very much about like that was so important to me though. Like I I I think that that is so important. I know you had a question about yeah. that specifically about yeah. like how do you how do you um, how do you have any sort of levity or yeah. any sort of like joy in this and the big part of that to me, number one, is the sisterhood, is Black sisterhood. Yeah, that was like yeah. the, one of the most important reasons for me to write this book. But secondly, mm -hmm. it being own voice. And own voice has gotten so misused. Yeah. I mean, <laughs> almost from jump. People are like, I ride horses. And you're like, own That's voice. Not. That is not even an exaggeration. No. That is literally something yeah. that has happened. Yeah. So own voice, you can't say that a book 
starring black girls, his own voice, if you are not yourself a black girl, period. Mm -hmm. Like yeah. you could you could be a siren in real life and you still <laughs> can't say this is like right? Like yeah. you could be a black no, man. Sure. Cannot, it is yeah. it is extremely specific because what you're dealing with is misogyny noir, which is specifically the misogyny that is directed toward black women. It is its own unique experience. But aside from that, you don't know what it is to be a black woman. You mm -hmm. don't know where this joy lives inside of this experience and how this is not something that you have to add. And when you have yeah. black sisterhood and when you have a network of black women, we are life-saving for each other. So you are literally like, I'm, I live this every single day. We are in an awful, horrible, tra hopefully transition era yeah. where I am watching my humanity be attacked and stripped on a daily basis. I'm watching what I have known is true and what I have yeah. known exists be completely unmasked and be completely out of the open and people almost be compelled in a sense where it seems like they can't stop themselves. Like you would say, if you know a camera's on, stop. Yeah. And, and yet it doesn't, right? So it's yeah. like, it has been completely brought out into the open and I'm watching this on a daily basis, but I laugh on a daily basis. I And not because I'm somehow, you know, downplaying the reality of what happened, yeah. but because I spend a lot of my time for sanity's sake, <laughs> for health's sake, I spend a lot of my time in conversation with Black women. And yeah. we understand things about our experience that no one else can understand. That means also there are, this is a place where I don't have to talk about this all the time because yeah. we all know it. We all understand it. So when you have like, when people are like, oh, can I write, uh, can I write a story about a black girl? If you're not a black girl, probably you can, not well. You're not. You can't. You can't actually accomplish it. No. Yeah. Can you? Can yeah. you? Can you do a mediocre job for some yeah. reason that has sure. to do with your own? So, sure. Go ahead. I mean, it's a. You know, yeah. it's a free country. So do yeah. whatever you want. But if you're asking why it fails, yeah, it's because you can't both be the victor and the oppressed. You can't. You can't both you know, erase people and also intrinsically understand people. For sure. So it, it, when people say like, how is their joy? How is their light? And that because I'm talking about fully people I know to be fully fleshed, fully dimensional yeah. people, because it's me. I yeah. know, I know where these, I know where the joy comes from. I know where the laughs come from. I know that we can be having, you know, there's, there are a couple of parts in the book where it's like something traumatic just happened. Yeah. <laughs> and then it's like, okay, but we're having sister talk now and, yeah. and we can immediately sort of like, and we can weave back and forth. It's not like we go yeah. away from it so that we don't have to think about it. It's just that you know, you can fluidly sort of move between these spaces yeah. together because you are both aware enough um, to be able to do it. So a part of when people say, why was it important to have both characters? To me, what we're used to seeing with diversity mm -hmm. is like a white cast with a black kid. Right. And very you're much plucking, you're plucking someone out of their real life and mm -hmm. you're just inserting them as garnish. And that is, and now that character has to carry the weight of their whole identity. They've got to carry the burden yeah. of, of everything that all of the interpersonal microaggressions or macroaggressions they experience or whatever. And they have no one, they have no community. Yeah. Um, and so when you, what inclusion actually looks like is not, keeping you know white protagonists at the same rate because that's over representation right oh um, yeah <laughs> it's lit i'm like we right no it is to make up 95 percent of the country no um so in when you take um especially a black woman character and you set her with other black women suddenly she's a whole yeah. person suddenly she has all of these dimensions suddenly she has all of this depth suddenly she can she can talk about something other than the thing that's going to educate the you know the white group of friends that she'd been plucked out and put around so it's it's so important to me that they had each other for i mean for any number of reasons but especially because that is how black women survive yeah, like just mentally, just like you know, it's it's not taking us out and and putting us in a foreign world right. or place where we are, where our identity is solely okay. I'm the black friend, but literally, I am a real person because because you're here, like because of right. us, I am me. Basically, yeah, 
Yeah, that's so like palpable in the book. And it actually makes me think, I, I could be wrong. I think it was like Ishi, Ishiguro or someone like that, like someone awesome who was like asked, like some, they said something in an interview about how they don't, they're not as interested in characters as they are relationships. And I think the thing that's so compelling about Tavia and Effie mm -hmm. is they are that that example of a bond where you where the very rare example of a bond where you see all of a person and they see right. all of you. And right. even just like no huge spoilers, I'm gonna try really hard, but even just like there's a moment where one of the girls is having sort of a moment with a love interest and the other one's there. And it's sort of like the other one just sort of like turns and like lets that that moment happen. Mm -hmm. And there's nothing more vulnerable really than that. Like there's nothing more emba like embarrassing than like <laughs> falling in love or having a crush. And to have your friend, your sister there, who's just like, I am, this is okay. You can be this person right. in front of me. You can be the soft person. You can be the angry person. You can be every right. single part of yourself. Right. And like, that's not a thing that you see very often in books, period. But I think like what you were saying, it's especially important when it's like most of the YA characters you're reading who are black are being put into this environment yeah. where it's like all white people. So it's right. like, like you said, they're educating or they're like- Right, they serve you know. some sort of function yeah. as opposed to being people. Yeah, um, It's extreme, community is super duper and proper inclusion is so important because it also allows us to be human. So instead of being a quota or yeah. instead of being like something to demonstrate that, oh, look, it's not 100% yeah. white, um, then, they, then they're actually allowed to be full and complete people. And I love having, okay, being complimented on relationships or friendship mm -hmm. by you is very special to me because oh. when the sky fell on <laughs> Splendor is like, you know, this just like the greatest ensemble and like, for, okay, so Emily clearly Please, actually has. Don't, don't go too hard on me. This is about you. Don't <laughs> like. Just, all I'm saying is like, it was very, I was like, she has to have the greatest friend group in real life <laughs> because when she writes friend groups, it's so real. Like it's so, it's like, okay, I want, I want to be in this friend group. Um, so yeah, that is a, that's a compliment. You are very nice. Like and I mean, I was, I didn't know that for sure that you had a sister, but I was like, Bethany has a sister, like, <laughs> and if not just amazing friends, whatever. And now it's like, I know you have both. Um, yes, I have, but yeah, I, have I definitely both. have three sisters and, oh but gosh. this is and that's literally, why, never mind. Yeah, go ahead. <laughs> this never mind. Is, I'll tell you later. This is uh, why, I talk about my sister Jennifer so much is because mm -hmm. I literally came up with the story with her. Um, yeah. I had hoped that we were going to co-write it together. Um, she has written over the years and I just thought that would be so great. She actually Aww. came up with the character of Effie and, and what Effie actually is. I ended yeah. up writing it, but I still think of it as our book. That's amazing. Um, so whenever people are like, Oh, how do you like, what did you, uh, how did you come up with their relationship? And I was like, well, it's a, it's a, it's what sisters are like. It's yeah. It's, in my experience, it's it's what sisters are like for each other. So that's incredible. I do want to ask: Do you consider yourself more of an Effie or more of a Tavia? I one hundred percent would have to say Tavia. But if I'm being super honest, in terms of because I see pieces of myself in Tavia, absolutely, yeah. and not just because I'm the IB um, student <laughs> and that was like super important to me. Um, but I have another character in the book who I'm like, if if I can talk about who I genuinely like relate to a lot, yeah. it's Naima. Really? Yeah. Wow. Like, um, but like the real Naima and yeah, not, yeah. and not the Naima that you only see through the lens of yeah. Tavi and Effie, uh Tavia and Effie not being fond of her. So um there is another story coming next year. Oh, yes. And about Naima? It, Yes, it's oh. from night. So it's like your I'm proper introduction yeah. to Naima, and absolutely. And now here's the thing: she's still Naima. Like it's yeah. not like oh, they yeah. got everything wrong about her. Um, but I 100 percent am like when people ever say like, "Oh, who do you? Who do you? Uh, yeah, who do you relate to more of the two? I'm like the one you don't like, probably. It's, I it's sort of Naima. love that. I think, I mean, first of all, it makes me really excited to get to know her more. And second of all, if you haven't read the book yet, again, we're trying to keep it somewhat spoiler light, but Naima right. is like sort of like a, she's not like the straight up antagonist of the story, but she no. is sort of like a blockade in a lot of moments or like 
the, she's the, like the, the high kids school don't get along. Friends. Well, yeah. exactly. It's like she, they don't get along. The kids don't yeah. get along. I've and said, that's all I've, it is. <laughs> yeah. I, but because of that and because of the way we read and also because of the way that we treat black girls, mm -hmm. particularly if you've already chosen a black girl that you like, you can't like right. them all. Um, oh, so, no, really. So, yeah, and, no, that makes sense. So, it's kind of an indictment of the reader, which I'm kind of always yeah, doing. Surprise. You are. Um, <laughs> <laughs> it's like, why do you think what you think? Um, yeah. But I really felt like I, I was surprised at how upset people were with Naima. And mm. I was like, up until a certain point in the story, tell me what she did wrong. Yeah, like, like, right. Like, and again, there's like, some spoilers, literally. but they're not, they're so not things can't. that would make you like think somebody's like a monster. It's right. like just like normal, normal it's, human it's things. Just normal t two people who don't, who don't necessarily like each other. Yeah. But um, yeah. I definitely had to tell people like the antagonist in this book is white supremacy. We are all yeah. on the same page, right? <laughs> yeah. Like, I, don't worry, you made that clear. I want you to know that you're you are a good writer, and that's very clear. <laughs> yeah. like, that's who that's who the the big bad guy is. Yeah. And I think it's, it's also Naima. difficult. It's not Naima. And I feel like it's difficult for people again because I'm always trying. I'm so sorry, you guys. I'm always challenging Western storytelling and and that's sociological. Good, don't that's awesome. Like, that's like my, and, and people are like, oh, because you are a student of sociology. I'm like, no, that's why I'm a student of sociology because yeah. I'm already doing this. 12 year old Bethany was exactly do. the same that's one. That's incredible. <laughs> I love that. Um, love but her. I definitely, <laughs> <laughs> I definitely was like, I, I want people to really interrogate like yeah. why it's so easy to jump to this conclusion and why we are like a bad person, like the, the antagonist has to be a person so that I can focus yeah. my dislike. And I'm like, isn't that easy? Like, isn't that really easy? If it's an interpersonal problem, that's yeah. solvable. Like I can, I can do something to change my experience if this is right. just an interpersonal problem. But if this is systemic. Way harder. <laughs> that's your fault. Like this yeah. is your job, yeah. right? Black people cannot fix white supremacy. We didn't yeah. build white supremacy. So I found it really interesting that like people want to imagine that the antagonist in a story about the systemic wow, suppression yeah. of black women is a black woman. I'm yeah, like, Come that's on, wild. Guys. And again, Come I on. do think, I mean, I, I, in, I think, you know, I think you're a phenomenal writer. So I think you made it very clear, but I also am still very excited to see what happens with her character. Cause that was something yeah. I was sort of thinking about too, because I think like, you know, the thing, like, obviously, the last couple of weeks, I have been thinking more and more about white feminism and just like right. my role in all of that. And I think like it, I think that the way that the girls see Naima is almost like, well, she has this one small advantage, which is that mm -hmm. she is an Aloko, which I don't know. If, is that how you pronounce it? Aloko? Yes, Aloko. Um, and so she, the girls think like she's got this one small advantage, this one small area of privilege. Um, and I think like it as I was reading empathizing with them I was like well do they feel like she's like like not willing to like speak out on like on their behalf or to stand with them because she's like afraid of losing that one little like speck mm -hmm. of dignity that she like right. gets currently right and yeah I mean I think the last couple of weeks have been a really like wild time for yeah. everyone but that's like kind of what it had me thinking it's like how many like white feminists like just are like oh well i'm i'm worrying about like me and my fight and not mm -hmm. like not like the greater ramifications and like i'm right. willing to let other people be like subjugated and oppressed right if, like because i'm afraid of like having my little stuff taken away or whatever oh absolutely and even in publishing and the conversations we've been having so we started talking um, and L.L. McKinney started that hashtag publishing paid me because yeah. it's really easy for people. Everybody wants to talk about wage equality and that's perfectly yeah. fine. But as soon as black women say, OK, but white women make more than us. Why yeah, women make right, more than exactly. black men? So yeah. you can't claim something as a feminist issue if no. when I bring up, wait a minute, let's let's talk about which women we're talking about. Yeah. And then suddenly it's a problem. And suddenly it's like, oh, this is divisive. And I'm like, well, what's right. divisive you is you accepting 90% more yeah. than I get is divisive. Yeah. And so, then thinking like that your battle is like the one that matters. Right, like that's, that's the one we should yeah. be focusing yeah. on so that we're not being divisive. Yeah. Um, you definitely, I will say that 
there are many, you know, again, black people are not a monolith, black women are not a monolith. And so there are very, very clear distinctions and differences um, personality wise with Naima that yeah. are, you can't separate from her being a loco because she was born yeah. a loco, right. but that are, but they, but it definitely also starts a commentary about who is considered authentic and how many rules mm. there are applied to that and what, yeah. and what internalized anti-blackness or, um, you know, w- what that looks like. Now we're not talking about a Candace Owens, like you can clearly <laughs> see this. Bird. We're never talking about a we're Candace Owens. We're never talking about a Candace Owens. Some people literally <laughs> are tap dancers. Like some yeah, people right, literally right. are minstrels and that, and even that again, as, as a student of sociology, I have to say, I'm never as upset at that person as I think other people are because no. I realize that they are the desired outcome. Yeah, they are. They are the so people real. who are properly responding to yeah. the messages that we are fed. Yeah, and so, like taking the scraps and being like, and, well, and if I can have this, then at least I have this. Exactly, and so yeah. I think that when people get upset at people like Candace Owens, I'm not saying that I'm uh, that I don't understand it. I'm just right. saying I. 100% think of people like that as victims of socialization. For sure. Um, this is, we live in a white supremacist world and particularly in the West, we live in an oppressively white supremacist society. And if you can get the pressure to stop somehow and it's a survival, and I think that's why yeah. I don't judge them the same way because it is literally a survival issue. Do yeah, I agree sure. with this person? No. Do I wish that they would maybe like disappear? <laughs> sure. But like, but it's not because I'm angry at them. My anger is reserved for white supremacy. Yeah. I, I recognize though that if you had been feeding somebody, if you've been feeding somebody poison, you expect them to get sick. You expect them to die. Yeah. Well, that's what has happened to people like Candace Owens. She has ingested, 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 and she yeah. has she is completely sick. And so she's rewarded because she's you know, she's expressing the desired, you know, she's, yeah. she's having the desired uh result uh, of everything that's happened. So I want to make it really clear that that also is not Naima. <laughs> right. Oh, no, no, um, no, no. Not even close. Right. No, none so, of so that. <laughs> I think it's really important yeah. to show her because yeah. I don't try to make her likable. I don't try to mm-hmm. change who she is. I don't try to make her palatable. I just try to say she's like this because this is her. Yeah. She's like, she's she just very much Naima does not suffer from any lack of self-worth or self-esteem. Mm-hmm. So regardless where she was raised or anything, like, like she is who she is. Yeah. And the problem is that if you did strip away that privilege, if you did strip away the Iloco aspect, she would be expected to sort of bleed out loud. She would be expected yeah. to sort of question herself for the benefit of other people. For a Black woman, you know, it you don't get to take pride in your accomplishments. You don't, you, it's a very small window between like, oh, this person is confident and, oh, she's, she's yeah. conceited. Oh, she's uppity. Oh, she's bougie. Oh, she's, we have a million different yeah. words Coded. for basically yeah. saying you're not the right kind of slightly self-conscious or slightly yeah. self-loathing black woman. And yeah. so we don't know how to talk and we don't, in our, in our social imagination, we don't have space for mm-hmm. that black girl. Yeah. Um, and so I really wanted to make sure that I'm always trying to take the conversation to the next conversation. I'm, I sat and watched this, this 101. <laughs> I've sat and watched this 101 conversation go on for yeah. years and years and years. Right. So I'm like, no, we need to get past this because if we stay at 101, we are centering the people who have a vested interest in pretending they don't get it. Mm-hmm. We're staying, we're staying in first gear because someone else is saying they don't get it. Why are we centering them? Let's move forward. Yeah. Um, so this is the this is the next conversation is what about when it's not a black girl who's in pain? What about when it's yeah. not a black girl who has a very visible scar? What if, what if it's not a girl who suffers from, you know, have, struggling with her power or struggling with her identity? What, yeah. what if it's a girl who's like, I know who I am. I, I and I, and I like myself. Um, yeah. And there's nothing you can do to change that. Yeah. Um, that- and what, yeah. Is so awesome. I mean, I think 
that's actually when you were talking about wanting levity and you're like, I'm a full person. These girls right. are going to be full people. Like they're going to have fun even while like this war is being waged on them essentially, because you find ways to have fun and have right. joy, even when a war is being waged on you. And I think like what you were like, what's talking about the importance of own voices. I think that that's something that like I notice as a reader, it's like, mm -hmm. if, if you're not own voices and you're writing a project, it's like, there's, there's nothing exploitative about this book. Right. There's nothing exploitative about it. it you know, the story you've lived the story, not the siren. Well, maybe the siren part. Um, my voice is power. That voice is power. That was my, that was, that was the whole beginning. The whole genesis yeah. of this book was saying to my sister, my voice is power. I'm like, I'm, I literally mean, I, I know why black women are treaty. You wouldn't try so hard to erase someone that you didn't know was powerful. You wouldn't bother. Right. For sure. Um, so it ignore. Proves you would ignore. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. And so that I mean, I just, true. that part is true. You, so <laughs> yeah. you basically, you, yes. But I like, am a there's nothing, I don't know. It's like, this isn't a book about black pain. Right. This is a book about black girls. Like it's yeah. about like, and I think that's like, I don't know. I don't know. It, it, it's just, it's incredible. <laughs> I can't say enough how incredible it is. And even when you were talking about Naima saying like, oh, she's not like likable. And my right. first thought then was like, why does she need to be likable? Like, exactly. She's, and, and that was, it was definitely, I, when I told my editor, you are, cause she already, my editor already didn't like Naima because yeah. <laughs> of this book. And I was yeah. like, you're going to have to learn because, yeah. and you're going to have to, and I'm really, I'm literally like saying even to my editor, like, yeah. um, I need you to interrogate why, yeah. uh, why do you have, why did you immediately dislike her? And, yeah. and, and, and yeah, you're not going to be given any reason. I don't have to give you a reason to change your mind because the conclusion you came to was unjust in the first place. Yeah. So she never, you know, she stays mad. Yeah. Um, I know that one of the questions, I'll just go ahead and say it here because yeah. we're already talking about it. I know that one of the questions is whether the Naima story is a prequel. It is not. Um, it is still a standalone. Uh, you don't have to have read A Song Below Water for it. But, but you're um, going to read both. But you're going to read both because if you're here, obviously mm -hmm. you're going to want to read A Song Below Water. I And here's the thing. I'm not, the reason I'm not worried about talking about and focusing on Naima before people read this book is because I have a CP who literally had never read A Song Below Water, period, while I was writing Naima. So wow. her first introduction to the whole world was Naima's book. Yeah. Um, and yes, she has since read A Song Below Water and she loves it according to her. And I don't believe she would lie to me because no, no, no. it would hurt my feelings. No. Yeah. <laughs> um, so no, so Naima is, Naima's story is called A Chorus Rises. And it chronologically follows A Song Below Water, but it's not a sequel. That's um, awesome. I love that. Yeah. So I don't know what to call it. I don't know. I don't think it fits the actual definition of a companion. It's right. just another book in the same world that chronologically follows A Song Below Water. Yeah. It's like almost like a spinoff. Yeah. And basically. when they make no, it into yeah, a TV yeah, show, sure. it'll be the spinoff. Yeah. That's what it is. So if everybody's listening... This is going to be a TV show. No. That's um, the plan. No, that is literally the plan. I'm um, like funding it. I'm just like vendoring you <laughs> like $50. Like, like will this it's work? Emily and Bethany production. Um, <laughs> it's really low budget and it's, it's filmed over via low quarantine. Budget, but and it'll just be streaming on YouTube. No. <laughs> it's going to be amazing. This is race started on YouTube. So let's not knock. That's so true. On. Yeah. I watched Awkward Black Girl on YouTube for so long with my sister Jennifer, with my Effie. Oh my gosh. And Yay. then, yeah. And so now we're watching Insecure on HBO. And it's and you're like, like, yeah. It. She's, she's kind of everywhere now. Like, she's, she's so everywhere and her fingers are in everything. Yes. She's incredible. Love, I love her. her. Exactly what I needed. Yes. And I will physically fight anyone who didn't feel the same. <laughs> I know. I know. I totally agree. I think my favorite genre of movie is like, like a date go re gone really wrong yes. like yes or just like that whole i don't know like something that's like almost a thriller but you're just like but it's like a thriller with like normal people just like being funny throughout. exactly but they're yeah. hilarious and their first like argument i was like i know a lot of people think that's an argument i thought that's it's like the dinner argument happen. right i thought that's just well um when they're when they're headed out to dinner and it turned well i don't want to tell people what it turns out oh being yeah because okay. when you find out what they're arguing about it's hilarious like oh yeah i did just remember serious and then you're like that's what this is about. i have 
friends who've had that exact same I love argument. it. I love it. Well, I not the like, exact same. It's a different different show that whatever, but, but yeah. But, right, but the but yeah. the same problem. Um, same problem. And it's so real. My issue was like, that's not even an argument to me. That's just how you talk to people. Yeah. <laughs> like, that's just no, how I talk. Just, you have, and that makes you sense because you've got this this beautiful, that. passionate brain. Um, <laughs> I have so many questions and I'm like, what? <laughs> I'm just going to end up like emailing you for questions just in my own personal life. I'm trying to think of everything. I'm like opening the notes I had. I'm not like texting just so everyone knows. Oh, I know what I wanted to ask. Okay. I'm, I'm over this conversation. Yeah. I'm just like, um, <laughs> I'm done. <hello. laughs> um, so my question, because something you were saying about talking to your editor and like pushing back and being like, I need you to ask why you don't like her. And just like to investigate that, interrogate that. I have noticed now I've read three of your books yes. and they're all very different. They're all incredible. <laughs> And this actually, there's like two questions that would kind of come off of that for me. But the first one is, I think of you as a very intentional writer mm -hmm. in a way that I don't really think of almost anyone else. And I actually remember when I like, like I remember talking to Justin Reynolds about this like a year or two ago, we were both just like talking about how obsessed with Mem we were. And I remember that picture you guys sent I know, me. we like sent you a picture. We're like fan club meeting. The fan um, club meeting. I love that. <laughs> yeah. And um, you're, like he was just saying something that like now I've seen has been true across like everything I've read of yours where he was just like, Bethany is so smart and she's so intentional. And like she, she has her vision and she's very cautious and careful about making sure that it can stay intact. Mm -hmm. And like, you, you know what you're going for, you know what you're doing. And I think that the thing that like, with this book, ev everything felt intentional. I thought like mm -hmm. the sirens, so the sirens for people who haven't read yet, this is not a, a spoiler, but they have like basically two calls that they use and one is compel and one is appeal. And I thought like, this is so intentional. And then like every supernatural being that's in it, which like some you don't know about until later. So I won't reference those, but there's like a gargoyle and sirens and a locos. Um, and there's some others that are like more sprites. off page. Right. Yes. Oh and my gosh. So just my and, like, chaotic, just my chaotic energy. Yeah, on the page. that's you there. Just like popping <laughs> like, everywhere boop, boop. in the woods. Bothering you for no reason. <laughs> <laughs> the best. The best yeah. kind of supernatural being is what we're really saying. But yeah. it felt so in, it felt so everything felt so intentional to me. And I wondered, like, without being too spoilery, like if there's anything you'd want to talk about behind those decisions, either like the, the calls, the like how you decided on, on what the sirens calls would be or how you chose which beings you knew needed to be a part of the story, because it really feels to me, and unless it was just a happy accident, it really feels like every choice was made with such care. I think that to understand my answer, you mm -hmm. have to go inside of my brain. So that's what we're all going to do right now. No, <laughs> I might just get in there. Um, no, the thing is that my, okay. So if we're going to talk a little bit about neuroanatomy, I'm so sorry to everyone. This is like um, the thing I want to hear. I'm just like, I'm going right. to school. Um, no, so like, you know how when you're supposed to go to sleep, it's like your cortex and your thalamus are supposed to like uh, sort of cycle down together or whatever. Mm -hmm. and if you if your brain doesn't do that like you have trouble falling asleep well a lot of people who experience completely inorganic like uh, am, um insomnia or whatever will be like well try working out more or oh did you eat something before you before you tried to sleep and all of these things that i'm like i know that sounds normal to you but i'm literally talking a brain chemistry issue here yeah where like my brain doesn't power down it hates powering down so i can be body exhausted and my brain's yeah. like no absolutely not because what <laughs> We've about got stuff to do <laughs> it's like remember that thing that happened six years oh ago gosh. let's let's unpack that um exactly so, the thing to think about when you're laying in bed definitely I mean, if you have yeah. no choice so yeah. my issue is like i always say my my nobody's imagination is created in a vacuum of course so when people say did you do this? A lot of times I feel like they're asking you, did you intentionally do this? Mm, and I yeah. can say to that, no, I did not come to an intentional okay. decision about that. But I, but I also know that my brain mm. is constantly going right in the background <laughs> of this conversation. My brain is thinking about something else and yeah. I can, like I can easily access it right now, but obviously that's I won't incredible this conversation. <laughs> but so because of like the amount the amount of processes I feel like are constantly going. I just think that my brain makes connections 
um, and sort of implants things. And I yeah. know because it's a very consistent part of my writing where I will leave something sort of open, not knowing what the reason is for this opening. And then I'll get to the point in the story and I'll say it and I won't have to do anything in the back end because it already oh made sense. So I'm like, my brain already did, like my brain already thought this through. <laughs> That's incredible. And it really, it makes sense. And I think especially like thinking of it as part of possibly insomnia and whatever goes into insomnia. It's like usually when you're dreaming, at least like I, what I think I've read is that it's like your brain is trying to work through things that have kind of gotten like stuck in your like amygdala it or has, something. Because it has so much yeah. more, it has so much more um, energy devoted to it because the rest mm -hmm. of your body is supposed to be powered down. Right. So, yeah. so you can sort of logical. And a lot of times I will take naps to if I'm if I'm trying to think of something for a story, I'll take a nap. But wow! One of the reasons why I loved um, the love that split the world, or the yeah yeah the, love that split the world. <laughs> I'm so sorry. This was one no, of my it was so reasons. it was years ago. <laughs> but I, was it like 25 years ago? I just yeah. I, it's been so long. But one of the things that, why I felt like that book was written like for me, despite the fact that we had never met until the debut group was because it dealt with hypno hypnagogic yeah. hallucinations, which is something I, right. Same. So, yeah. So I was like, oh no, this is for people who have ever existed um, sort of right before you fall asleep or right when you're supposed to be waking up, but there's like a space in between it where you are fully sort of engaging with the environment around you um, but your but your brain is still functioning as though you're asleep. So just straight up adding things to the room you're right. in, and like. So I used to when I was in university, and especially with me, if it's like a, I mean, I guess it was had to do with high stress, which is not that yeah. university was stressful after high school. I'm sorry, high school was right. way, more, way, way worse, more intense, way more intense um, academically than because you were the IB kid, right? So I went to university, and I was like, Boy. am I? Am I missing some stuff I'm supposed to be doing right now? Um, but I don't know what it was, but it was during that time period that I had a lot of those hallucinations so mm -hmm. and, and sleep paralysis. So I would literally be like a laying on the bed and I would see someone in my room. The door would, and this is why I, I, I had to face away from doors, I figured out, when I fell asleep. Because if I saw the door before I fell asleep. Then that I, would happen. Then that would happen. Yeah, wow. So I would be coming out of whenever I would be uh, sort of coming up through the stages of, of sleep uh, enough to be aware of my surroundings again, I would have a fully like a full view <laughs> of the room and the person standing there and then the person would walk over and sit on my bed and you can feel it's a oh. perfect sensory replication of what it feels like when somebody sits on the edge of your bed and then usually like push down on my chest or something and there's nothing oh, you man. can do because you're not actually awake. Yeah. Just your, like your eyes are open, basically. Right. And so you're like, your eyes are, it's, and that's why I started having sort of an obsession with like cataplexy. I don't yeah. know if anybody else who says my favorite neurological disorder is, but my favorite neurological disorder is cataplexy. She said this resonates so much. Hi, Heather. Yeah. And I also have to say, I just found out that I think I have a mild version of that because somebody messaged me on Instagram and like was like read something in my new book and was like, this is cataplexy. And I was like, I had no idea. I could no, I'm so serious. When I read your first book, I was like, she is like perfectly describing something that I first experienced. And then obviously, like when I did clinical uh, psych, we had neuroanatomy and stuff, of course. And um, and yeah, and so narco usually people are talking about narcolepsy, but cataplexy is something like so specific and just so freaking intriguing. Um and about like the fact that your senses and your neurons and everything are all um, inputting information as though you, but you have no control. Like you can't respond mm -hmm. to them. You can just experience them, which is why it is so terrifying. I don't remember how we got here, but the point is <laughs> my brain is like never, my brain is just never it's, not. It's braiding the story together it's, and so you're not it's, doing the work actively, but it's I, happening. I, the, the most I will say is like, when I think of, I don't ever say, I'm going to write a book about, you know, um, uh, I don't know, like uh, uh, about uh, white supremacy or something. Yeah. <laughs> but, it, but it definitely is something that like I am constantly trying to interrogate or or like I said, indict. So I wouldn't write a story that wasn't going to meaningfully right. speak to this or wasn't going to uh, meaningfully express or expose or illuminate something about the Black woman experience. Um and so I think my brain is like always 
the, I start with concept. And so like I, I said, my voice is power to my sister. And then I said, that sounds like something a siren would say. What if all sirens are black women? And then that, and because of that, Tavia came into my mind as a siren for that reason. Yeah. Um, so I think somebody else asked something about like, do they come, you know, first as a, did she come as a siren first or did she come as a girl and you decide about the siren thing? It all, I can't describe how this works, but it all happened literally immediately wow. as soon as i said my voice is power and i said black girls are sirens and only black girls are sirens tavia was there and she was a siren and if i and the part of my brain that's conscious that is the sociologist is like if only black women can be this this is a this is a yeah thing. yeah just immediately based on the world as we know it if only black women can be this this is something that you're not supposed to be so yeah. if that's true then there's someone else that is also magical that is the desired almost the acceptable in, right but almost in a, a sort of a spiteful specifically because we the only way for you to ex to understand how unwanted you are is to see us gorge ourselves on someone else to see us yeah. uh, you know just adore and fixate on someone else because we have to be erasing you at all times that requires that we choose someone to anoint as the right one so that you right. can really get this message that you're the wrong one and like i said we see this in society right so mm -hmm. So I created the Aloko specifically to be that person. And now I chose Aloko because number one, I was decentering Western mythos. Right. And I didn't want any of the things at play to be, to have a major, you know, um, origin story in the West because yeah. that is, we, we need to be done with that. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so so I, I chose Aloko and they are from a Central African origin, but because I am diaspora, because I am Black American specifically, I am completely divorced from the continent in terms of having, being able to claim some sort of identity right. or cultural marriage or whatever. That's all intentionally done to me. That's not something I chose. That's something that was done to me. So because of that, I wanted to have sort of like a telephone effect of what, it, and especially I'm a West Coast Black girl. Yeah. So even the stories that are told about what it is to be black in America have, don't take me into account whatsoever. Um, yeah. It's, it's either after the great migration and it's in like the Midwest and the Northeast or it's before that. And it's like Southern and this right, is right. Black, right. This is how you know what black people are like. Cause you have to, it has to be set, you know, in mobile or something. Yeah. And so if you're black American, you have a very distinct in in the, on the west coast or in the pacific northwest you have a very distinct experience that is almost completely left out of all entertainment representation mm. anything um yeah. and it's a very it's a very distinct experience um of an insidious kind of racism that demands that you be grateful for not being in the South and for what you supposedly don't have to put up with. Um, and I wanted specifically for us to be all the way on the West Coast, number one, to to demonstrate like, hey, I see I, you Black kids who are growing up on the West Coast. I see you. I see what you have to deal with. I see yeah. what you have to, have to go through that people are constantly gaslighting you about. But also to show the real extent of this divorce um, from any sort yeah. of content, um, connection and again so, a very intentional writer even if not <laughs> consciously right. so. even if not like consciously doing yeah. all of these steps before it's on the page um and i don't think there's anything wrong with looking at what you've already written and and recognizing what you've right. done right right um, the pattern I, yeah right recognizing the pattern and what you're doing i think is perfectly valid so i don't want people to think like oh since i'm not intentionally doing something that i know of consciously while i'm writing i must not be doing anything well right <laughs> it and then read it and see what you did um yeah. but but i wanted that telephone effect of like the, the mythos of a loco is so wrong in this book intentionally um it really doesn't match with cool. what the origin and and so even in, in central african folklore the plural of a loco is beloco but in the ah. book it's just a loco because yeah. that's because we're in america <laughs> because we're in the united states yeah. we're all the way on the west coast and yeah. this, this is a story told to another person to, to another person wow to yeah and what you lose and and aside from any so that's a completely separate com commentary in my mind and aside from that it's demonstrating also the mythology of mythology which is like yeah 
we are who we allow to rewrite their mythos uh and and how it can so easily change and easily become benign if you're the right people mm -hmm. so my ex my my uh example of this and something that i feel very strongly like legitimately feel strongly about so i was married for 15 years to um a wonderful guy who is a third generation norwegian and you know so there's this there's this great sort of like viking not with him thank god but like <laughs> you know like this is you know right. the vikings and we're vikings and vikings yeah. are, this is what it is to be viking and blah blah and i'm and now you have all these television i have literally refused to ever watch any entertainment that glamorizes or centers vikings because how did we decide to so rehabilitate these people that we are now showing it as some sort of like yeah. brute, like amazing strength and masculine and, and romantic and sexy and and i'm like they the damage that they did right yeah like, the, the reign of terror the swath of like blood and rape and pillaging and stuff yeah and and, and now, like, but cool haircuts <laughs> but really cool haircuts and now they're the most peaceful docile people on earth and yeah. i'm like really like i just because yeah. most of us don't get our mythology rewritten. Most of yeah. us don't get to decide, okay, now we're going to take something that was known for its brute violence and we're going to completely rehabilitate it and make it something hyper desirable. desirable. Yeah. And, and we're going to sell it to you 100% as something that's desirable and nobody's going to say anything about it. And just yeah. on a principle level, I'm like, I refuse. Yeah. Absolutely not. <laughs> in yeah. no way, shape, or form, and I'm married to a third generation Norwegian, and no. Um, yeah. I just, I can't. So that has always, I've always been paying attention to stuff like that, and and really just despising the hypocrisy yeah. and the illogicalness of taking people that you subjugated and, like, people that you expressly and intentionally dehumanized and deciding their mythology and refusing to part with it such yeah. that even when they die at your hand, it's their fault. But over here, but but you can rehabilitate, right? Vikings. No, yeah, for sure. So I was like, this is to me, a loco are really about the mythology of mythology and and the fact that this is a choice. We've decided, we've decided to love these people. So if I tell you a little bit about their original mythos, they were cannibals. They're, yeah. These, yeah. they're these diminutive, they're these, and they live in trees and they almost like, I feel like their skin, I think that their skin is also like uh, uh, leaves and, and grass and that sort of thing because they use camouflage and stuff to trick people and everything. And they're greatly feared, right? So in the book, of course, nobody believes that. Of course, <laughs> like, right? It's just, it's yeah. just the whole, you have a pretty, a pretty disturbing mythos and people are like, nope. Yeah, and I thought that was Not actually true. really interesting. And again, a thing that makes me excited for Naima's story is the fact that uh, Priam is like, even though that's like nobody, like nobody puts any stock yeah. in it, he's sort of like, but what if people like suddenly did? Like it's still, I'm just, I'm very excited. <laughs> it's like, I know yes. you guys, I, like, I want to talk about all of your books that are coming after this, even though <laughs> like, because this one, I'm like, I love it, but I've been loving it for months. Like, right, you right. Know. she's like, this is old news. Yeah, oh, no, no I, I mean, like, I literally might reread the first half again tomorrow. So I am really, really excited for I'm I, I really love this book. I did not it, I will say that I didn't intend for it to seem as timely as it does. I'm sure. That's I mean, you heart, wrote it like two years ago. Right. That's I'm, a heartbreaking yeah. thing for me. That's not like a, oh, this is so, what a happy coincidence. Yeah. It's literally like I was hoping to, um, from a distance, help Black girls and teenagers who are who lived through that uh, when I was writing it in 2017. Right. To sort of reflect on something from a safe distance um, and sort of process something that was over or that not that right. was over, but that had passed. Yeah. So for it to come out when it came out, I had a, I had a Twitter live that was scheduled for oh. the day it came out. And yeah. I was like, I can't, I, I can't do yeah. this. Um, because all of the, um, the protests had just started and uh, Brianna Taylor. So the, the woman in yeah. my book is named Rhoda Taylor. 
Right. And, and it's the say her name character mm -hmm. because of her death. And so around the same time that the book came out, uh, Brianna Taylor was killed in yeah. her bed asleep um, by law enforcement. And as we can see, it has taken a lot to keep her name yeah. in the public eye. It, everything, yeah. and, and people always act like, you know, Black women are supposed to just ignore, you know, for the sake of liberation, we're supposed to not criticize the fact that, wait a minute, why can everybody remember George Floyd's name? Why yeah. can everyone talk about justice for George Floyd, at which they should Right. But also, but also I'm going to notice and somebody posted, this is what it's like so painful for me right now because someone posted a quote from my book that was about, I have to, yeah, I, take, yeah. Um, that was about, um, what would happen if it were a black woman, how half of how only half of the turnout, if that would show up, yeah. how people would forget so quickly. And, it, and for the, for the women's last names to be the same was like, really? Yeah. Like the universe is like for my fictitious woman that we're talking about in the book to have the same last name as Brianna Taylor was almost too much. Like I just, because and so we're watching it in real time right now. We're watching yeah. in real time the disparity between the coverage, between the calls for justice. And I'm like, you guys, is anybody gonna pretend they don't see this? Like, are you really gonna pretend that I that I would have to underline this? And someone sadly was like, uh, a song below water is is prophetic. And I'm like, no, it isn't. It's been happening. Yeah, I wrote it three years ago. Yeah. It's not prophetic. You just weren't listening. Yeah. That's, I mean, that's so, that's so real. I feel like honestly, Brianna, I feel like is one of the first women's names who I have actually like seen like, and like, again, her, her murderers have not been arrested yet. So everybody who's watching and who has not yet called or signed petitions, will I'll share stuff again on Instagram after this. Um, but she's from Louisville, so it's going to be like the Kentucky uh, Attorney General, Governor, um, yeah, everyone. I'll, I'll share all of that information. I have it. I have it handy. But yeah, I mean, it's it was hard. Re that was in this the half that I reread today, and definitely like made me think of that too. <laughs> I'm, it's breaking my heart. People f coming across all of these things where it seems like I'm talking about Brianna when I wasn't. No. Um, because it's like it it just keeps it just keeps happening and it's not happening any less to black women than black men so why is this why is it that we have to say say her name yeah like specifically say her name and then i saw today there is a painting which is george floyd and a, and then a lot of different um um other people kind of shown through his i don't I can't artistic talk right now. Anyway, <laughs> but it's called Say Their Name. And I was like, yeah. no, what? Don't do that. Like, we're talking, yeah. we're talking about a very Indiv specific erasure. We're talking yeah, their very names. That's a lot of individual people, you guys. Um, but but say her name. Yeah, yeah. Just a hashtag that Black yeah. women started using because of the unique erasure and complete disregard of black women yeah. who were killed at the hands of law enforcement. So to take something and be like, okay, we're still going to talk about everybody. But in talking about everyone, we always forget yeah. to talk about us. That's the problem with saying, well, let's, let's talk, let's make this about everybody. That's the problem with feminism, <laughs> with white feminism. Yeah. Let's, let's talk about everybody. No, because no, your it's experience not everybody. is different from my experience. Yeah. So if we yeah. talk about everybody, we're just talking about you. Yeah. Sometimes we have to specifically talk about the people who are in the worst danger and especially the, the least chance of being of, of seeing justice. For sure. Because people will just legit forget about her. She was asleep in her bed. What less could you what I mean? Yeah. And like the guy that they were trying to arrest and it lived there and had already been arrested. <laughs> I'm just, it was, and then her, and, you know, obviously, like, who knows the torment of her boyfriend seeing that and then being arrested for firing back in his house. 
Like, and they were plain clothes, so he didn't even know that they were police and officers. Didn't, and didn't announce themselves, and and had a had a had a warrant that that said they didn't have to. So, and people have been talking about how did we pass a law, Brianna uh, Taylor's law, to you know because you recognize what a heinous crime this is, and yet we haven't charged anybody for her murder. It's a dodge for sure. It's a dodge. But well, let's paint, let's paint Black Lives Matter on the streets, and that'll change everything. Go ahead. <laughs> like anyway, I mean, I'm, I'm so night. sorry to like interrupt this wonderful conversation, but uh, we are running out of time. So if you wanted to answer one last uh, quick question, or if you wanted to uh, do a closing statement, do you want to take a look Let's at the questions see. and see what you want to? I'm going to look at the questions. Okay, I've never read Lovecraft, so that's a really easy one to answer. Um, my story is not in conversation with that story because I've never read it. Um, what books have we read this year so far that we highly recommend? Ooh. Oh, what do you hope readers take away from Tavia and Effie's conversation? I kind of want that one, personally. That's my vote. Okay, I, and then really quickly, because I saw this other one, I don't plan to write, um, I don't plan to write more contemporary fantasy, but I didn't plan to write contemporary fantasy. <laughs> that means nothing. Um, <laughs> You'll be back. I <laughs> I just, I just don't say what I write anymore because I just write whatever the concept calls for. Um, I would say that what I hope, I really only have hopes for what Black girls will take from the discussion of hair and beauty in the book, which is uh, to say that the way that you feel about your appearance is intentional. It is, It didn't originate in you. It is not your fault. It is literally what you are programmed and socialized to think of yourself. And it's always in comparison to somebody who has already been shown to you to be better or more desirable. So um, I loved it was a huge deal for me. I said they, their hair has to be prominently featured on the cover. Um, they are both natural hair girls. They wear their hair completely differently. They have different hair textures. And I wanted it to be a fun, uh, something that this is the most disparaged part physically of being a black woman is our hair. And I wanted to show them enjoying it. I wanted to show them uh, having a bond over it. Um, I have hair nights with my girlfriends, like literally nights where it's like where we deep condition and, and watch a musical. Um, and it's And it's something that's just, it is beautiful as long as you first deprogram all of the anti-blackness that you have been forced to ingest all of your life. Awesome answer. Awesome. Also, look at it. I love it. It's so beautiful. <laughs> I would apologize for like the, you know, how serious we got, but I can't because this is- No, this is it was gonna happen. Oh, no, don't in. apologize for that. This is the world <laughs> I actually live in. This is the world that caused me to write this book in the first place. Yeah. And I take no responsibility for the state of this world, so. No, that's not, but the beautiful yeah. book, that was all you. And I really am <laughs> so excited for everyone who hasn't read it yet to read it. And I, like like I said, I mean, I expected it to feel like really hard to be rereading it at this like moment. And it, it actually was like so cathartic and just, I don't know. It's like one of the first things to sweep me away in quarantine period. So um, I think I think that everybody is gonna be really surprised at how much joy they're gonna get out of this book yeah. about a really hard thing. I think that it, the look, acknowledging the truth actually feels so much better than gaslighting. Yeah. Like literally, uh, literally just facing what is actually happening and having pe and having hope despite that is so much stronger than faking it and faking unity when no work has been done. Um, so I hope that people find that looking at the problem is, it goes a lot further for your mental health in the long run. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> thank you for well, the comments, so everyone. Much. Yeah, thank you to everyone who tuned in. Uh, it was lovely hosting you both, uh, Bethany and Emily. That was Thank such you. a great conversation. Um, and again, to the audience members, uh, if you purchase a copy of A Song Below Water from Romans, uh, we do have signed book plates and exclusive enamel pins available. Just make sure to write book plate in the notes section when you're checking out your purchase. Also, I, I included links to ebook and audiobook links to um, both Emily's books and Bethany's books. So uh, just look in the chat for that. 
Also, um, if you'd like regular updates on our upcoming events, just make sure to subscribe to our newsletter and to subscribe to our Crowdcast channel. Um, and with that said, stay safe, everyone, and have a great evening. Right, thank you so much. Thank you. Right. Thanks for having us.